welcome back <laughs> uh, the title of today's passage is uh, the gospel not the human word but God's word based on first Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 16 key verse is chapter 2 verse 13 let's read together and we always thank God continually because when you receive the word of God which you heard from us you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed a work in you who believe. Amen. Okay, let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for giving us this time to come together to worship you. We understand what a blessing we have now during this pandemic time, we can come to church to worship you freely. Um, many places, they are not able to come together to worship you anymore because of a pandemic. Lord, please be to all those, who, our spiritual brothers and sisters, and bless them to find a way to worship you every Sunday in their home or some secret place. Lord, and guide them and protect them and help them to hold the word of God as the God's word, not the human word, so that they may live spiritually by your grace. Lord, please be with us this time with your Holy Spirit and guide us and protect us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. In chapters two and three, Paul recounts how he preached the gospel and lived among the Thessalonians. A past Paul's life and ministry is something all gospel workers should follow, especially if we are interested in discipleship making ministry. Many people wonder how a past Paul had such a successful ministry in Thessalonica because a past Paul preached the gospel for only three weeks in synagogues in Thessalonica. And he stayed in Thessalonica only a few months. However, the Thessalonican church grew strong and the faith of the Thessalonican church was known throughout the Gentile world. So how was this possible? Pastor Paul and then we uh, served God's mission in Milwaukee for more than 30 years now. We thank God that God allow us to have uh, this beautiful church. We have a uh, few faithful God's servants who worship with us today. But the uh, Apostle Paul's ministry in Thessalonica is beyond our imagination. He stayed there just for many Bible scholars believe that he stayed in Thessalonica about for three months. But his church, he established in his, uh, Thessalonica, blossomed and grew continually after he left. We can find out when we look how a passport lived with the Thessalonians with the gospel. The gospel itself has power, but the effectiveness of the gospel is closely related to the lives of the gospel workers. Many people have asked Dr. Billy Graham the secret of his fruitful ministry. His response is simple. Keep your preaching focused on the gospel message and live with integrity. On the other hand, if, the, if a gospel worker loses his integrity, his gospel message will be discredited. In today's passage, we see that the enemies of the gospel knew the very well. They accused the Paul of having an impure motive. They planned doubts in the hearts of Thessalonica believers to, to discredit the gospel message. These kinds of accusations are not unusual. In dealing with them, Paul revealed his integrity as a gospel worker. 
Gospel workers must live with integrity to advance the gospel. At the same time, those who hear the gospel need spiritual discernment. They need to distinguish between God's word and human ideas. Spiritual discernment is not a small matter. It is related to our salvation. Let us learn from Paul how to have a spiritual discernment and how to do gospel work more fruitfully. Part 1, Paul's motive, verses 1 through 6a. In verses 1 and 2, Paul writes how he could boldly preach the gospel. To understand this statement, it is helpful to review Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. So we can read all these stories in Acts. Paul and his companions wanted to preach the gospel in Asia, but they could not. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging them, come over to Macedonia and help us. After seeing this vision, Paul got ready at once to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called him to preach the gospel to them. This decision changed the course of world history. It led to the evangelization of the Roman Empire and the rise of a Christian Europe. Paul first entered the Macedonia soil when he arrived in Philippi, which was a major city. Apostle Paul and his companions met Lydia, a businesswoman beside the river, and evangelized her and her family. Her family became a first Christian house church in European history. On a different day, Paul, had, Paul, Paul and his companions met a slave girl who was possessed by an evil spirit. Her owners made a great deal of money through her fortune telling. So she had an evil spirit and evil spirit allowed her to say about future. So many people went to her to ask their life or how to solve their life problem or their destiny, something like that. And she was so popular, many people owned her. So basically, through having her, those people was having a, a company. When she irritated Paul, irritated Paul, she followed everywhere Paul went and she shouted, Paul was the servant of God, listen to him. Her message was like a free advertisement to Apostle Paul's ministry. However, she followed everywhere where, she, uh, where Apostle Paul went. And finally, Apostle Paul said, that's enough. <laughs> So he drove out evil spirit from her in the name of Jesus. Then her owners became angry because they lost their fortune-telling business. They stirred up a mob by inciting the Roman magistrate against Paul and Silas. Without giving trial, they were stripped, beaten with rods, severely flogged, and thrown into prison with their feet fastened in the stocks. It was a terrible and painful humiliation. In that moment, they could have become so discouraged and powerless, so all angry and bitter. But even until midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God. Then a miracle happened. All the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer felt responsible for a mass prison break and was going to commit suicide. Actually, nobody escaped from the jail, but he thought because jail doors opened, so he thought everybody already ran away, but nobody left. But Paul stopped him and assured him that no one had escaped. In desperation, the jailer asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. 
In this way, one more household was added to the Philippian church. Paul got out of prison and went to Thessalonica. Paul reminded them of these verses 1 and 2. Let's read verses 1 and 2 together here. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without result. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you by his gospel in the face of strong opposition. The word feared means to speak boldly in the face of opposition. This was possible by the help of God. Paul's annals and power was gone. But when he depended on God, God became his source of strength and courage and enabled him to preach the gospel boldly. There was a great work of God. In a span of three weeks, numerous people heard the gospel, accepted it, and were completely changed. This is what it means that a Paul's visit to them was effective. Where God works powerfully, there is also a work of Satan. As you know, Satan hates God's work. Satan wants to destroy the work of God. So if there is a work of God, Satan always works mightily to against them. In every way. A position arose through the jealousy of the Jews. They rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot out in the city. They tried to kill Paul and Silas. In that time of emergency, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to the city of Berea. So Thessalonican church people made a special evacuation plan. So they safely evacuated Paul and Silas to the near city, Berea. And later they went to Corinth. But for the enemies of the gospel, this became the basis of their accusation. They may have said, Paul is coward. That's why he did not return. He's like all other false teachers who try to make money. He does not care about you at all. Their purpose was not to plant doubts. Their purpose was to plant doubts about Paul to discredit his gospel message. We know that Paul cared very little if he was judged by human beings. But out of concern for the Thessalonican believers, he decided to defend himself. In verses 3 through 68, we can find the enemies of the gospel lied, saying Paul's motive was impure. His method was trickery. He was making greed, and he was using flattery to win people's praise. These first accusations were insidious. Those who spread them were wicked, wicked and were used by the devil. Anyone who holds these things could be spiritually poisoned and become sick. You know, this is the one of the easiest way to attack God's ministry, attack God's leader, and then plant doubt about their spiritual integrity. That's the how Satan always do, almost always try to do. In this way, separate spiritual leaders and uh, church members so that work of God cannot be advanced anymore. Anyone who holds these things could be spiritually poisoned and become sick. To defend himself, Paul said in verse 4, On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our heart. No one knows the deep motives of a person's heart, but God knows. 
God tests his servants again and again until their motive is purified and their desire is to please God alone. Paul had been tested and approved by God. So God entrusted him with preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul said confidently that God was his witness. Amen. Here we learn how vital it is to have a pure motive in serve God's people. We need to examine whether our motive is pure or not. Peter, the apostle, encourages. Let's read together this verse. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2-4. through 4. Are you ready? Let's read. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not loading it over those entrusted to you, be being example to the flock. And when the shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory, they will never fade away. Amen. To human eyes, those who have a pure motive may look very naive, right? If you serve other people without receiving any benefit and without any advantage, then worldly people will think, oh, that's very weird. Why he's doing that? That's very stupid. But in truth, Pure motive is the most powerful element in a fruitful and gospel ministry. There is no substitute for a pure motive. Although we may be skillful, talented, and able, if our motives are not pure, God cannot use us, and our ministry will not last long. So we need to pray like David, Create me in me a pure heart, O oh God. So verses 5 and 6 say, You know we never used flattery, nor did we put a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Apostle Paul decided to defend himself, not for his name, but for the believers in the Thessalonican church. He felt tremendous responsibility as a shepherd because ferocious wolves were coming to the church to use, to use church people for their benefit. He reminded them he did not use any flattery, put a mask to cover up greed. No one looked for praise from any person. He did not even use his authority as an apostle to force them to follow the gospel. Then how did he move the hearts of the Thessalonican Christians? Part 2, Paul's life. In these verses, Paul reminded the Thessalonicans how he had lived and served among them. Especially he used two metaphors, a nursing mother and a father. Through this, we can see his mindset as God's servant. When we think about Apostle Paul, it is easy to imagine him as a strong leader with a great authority who never compromised. He was like a debate champion who never loses or a general commanding his troops. That was one side of him. But he also had another side. He was humble and gentle. Although he had authority as an apostle, he did not use it to load it over them. He cared for the Thessalonian, Thessalonian believers like a nursing mother. He accepted them as they were, bore with them and serve them unconditionally without demanding or respecting anything in return. If, if you imagine that, you can understand how difficult it was because most of the Thessalonican church members were Gentiles. That means 
they do not have a lot of Bible knowledge, and they do not have a lot of understanding about spiritual life or godly life. They used to live to worship the idols. They used to live very immoral life. You know the Greek people and Romans, they live a very immoral life. Apostle Paul had to serve them as a Bible teacher and shepherd to change their lives. For me, it seems like impossible. But Apostle Paul, he did it. He accepted as they were, bore with them and served them unconditionally without demanding or expecting anything in return. This is easy to talk about, but when we try to serve one person with the mindset of a nursing mother, we find this is not easy at all. Did Paul really serve them like a nursing mother? How could he do that? Before knowing Jesus, Paul was the last person to be like a nursing mother. He was harsh and violent, ready to crush opposition. Do you remember? Apostle Paul arrested all believers and put them in prison and then allowed them to be killed by the Jewish leaders. Even he decided to arrest believers in Damascus. Damascus was a foreign city. It was not inside of Judea. It's almost like uh, he decided to persecute Christians. Even though he was in USA, he decided to go to the Canada, Montreal, to arrest Christians and bring them in Judea and kill them. He was a person like that. We know that even after being born again, we do not change easily. Some people conclude that it is impossible to change one's character. But Paul was changed to be like a nursing mother. It happened as he learned the mind of Christ through much struggle. This transform transformation does not come naturally. We must struggle intentionally, depending on the Holy Spirit. Paul said, I died every day. And I literally, I believe that. To serve all those simple men, he has to die. <laughs> You know, the, the reformers, the, who was the, the reformed church, the first person? Hmm? Martin Luther, yeah? Martin Luther said, you know, if I were Jesus, I destroyed the world three times in a day, he said. I destroyed the world three, three times in a, world, in a day, he said. I think I can destroy the world ten times in a world. <laughs> <laughs> Paul said, I die every day. He had to deny his desire to curse them, but he denied, rejected his thinking for serve God. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is the word we have to remember as a Christian or as a Christian leader. We died with Christ. So we cannot do as we want. And then I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Otherwise, how can we serve God? How can we serve others? When Paul submitted himself to, the, to this Jesus as his Lord, moment by moment, Christ changed him into one like nursing mother. It is not just special people who can be changed. 
Anyone who submits to Jesus will be changed. Amen. In verse 8, we find that Paul's pure motive was love, like a nursing mother. He said, because we love you so much, we are delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul shared not only the gospel, but his life as well. When Christ's love com compels us, we want to give everything to our loved one. In New Map Ministry, we encourage our young Bible students to begin common life. Many times their Bible teachers live with them. It seems odd sometimes. But it is how Jesus cared for his disciples and raised them as gospel workers. Apostle Paul also did the same thing with the Thessalonians. Apostle Paul and his companion opened and shared their lives with the Thessalonian believers. That was why his ministry in Thessalonica was short but effective. They learned about Jesus by sharing lives with Apostle Paul, Silas, and Apostle Paul's disciple, Timothy. Now, if you think about that, three gospel workers, they live with the Thessalonican church believers and share their lives with them. I don't think there were a lot, maybe 10 people, maybe about less than, I think, maybe 15. But he shared, they shared their lives with them. Paul, a pastor like a father, Silas like a spiritual mother, and Timothy as a good disciple of a pastor. Timothy showed them good example, how they should learn from a pastor and how they should live as a disciple of Jesus. So I have to say that three persons were perfect perfect team to raise disciples. Literally, they ate and slept with them together. First John chapter 3, verse 16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. You know, even though they did not kill themselves, you know, when they live with them after denying their personal life, that is exactly like, uh, you know, lay, lay down their lives for them. That much having a common life with uh, young brothers and sisters is not easy at all. Genuine love labors. Genuine love labors. To become a blessing, not a burden, Paul worked hard night and day to support himself while carrying out his gospel ministry. Apostle Paul described his life among them in verses 9 and 10. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel to God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Let's read together, all together one more time. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship, we walk night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, oh how holy, righteous, and blameless we are among you who believe. So how could they know? How could the Thessalonican church people know how he lived? Because they live with them. They saw a pastor preach the word of God and had Bible studies, had a you know, Bible uh, uh, study workshop you know, with them all day long, and during the night they have to work as a tent makers. You know, they saw how they work hard and then we have to sell this one tomorrow <laughs> so that we can buy lunch or breakfast. <laughs> they never ask any money from them. They serve them 
and they serve themselves. And they live a holy and righteous life before them. Their life truly moved their heart. Thessalonican church people saw difference from them. They were genuine Christians. And they saw the work of the Holy Spirit among them. And their life was changed through their lives. You know, we have our spiritual leaders, James, you know, also, also Chef Chris, and then we have a few spiritual leaders here, also Shepherd Jeff. Those spiritual leaders all went through the common life when they are young, right? They live with Pastor Paul, and I still remember Shepherd, Shepherd Chris lived with the Shepherd Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Amazingly, someone who lived a common life with the other brothers and sisters, with the spiritual leaders, they become spiritual leaders and remain in church ministry. Those who just come to church, have Bible studies, and left, they did not remain. As we know, a characteristic of love is that it does not delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. Love must be sincere, hating what is evil, and cling to what is good. Paul's love for the Thessalonians motivated him to live a holy, righteous, and blameless life among them. Those Thessalonian Christians sincerely learned life in Jesus, when the apostles shared their life with them. Let's, let us read verses 11 and 12 together. Are you ready? Let's go. For you know that we deal with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So when Apostle Paul lived with them, he was taught them directly how they should live, like father taught their children. As we see in verses 11 and 12, not only did Paul express nurturing tenderness of a mother, he also demonstrated the strength of a father's love by encouraging, comforting, and urging the Thessalonican Thessalonian towards godly living. To grow as healthy and mature people, children need both their mother and their father. As you, he matured in Jesus' love, Paul could fill both roles. It's amazing. He worked as a, like a spiritual mother and spiritual father. Maybe Silas was spiritual mom, or Pastor Paul was a spiritual father. And then maybe Timothy was a spiritual older brother. <laughs> but anyway, when they serve God, they fulfilled their duty as a spiritual father and spiritual mother. Paul's shepherd life is indeed exemplary. It is because he learned the shepherd life of Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Part three, people's response. Though Paul had preached the gospel by the power of God with a pure motive and lived with a holy love among the Thessalonians, he knew that he was just a, he was just a vessel. It was God's work through him to plant the seed of his word in the hearts of the believers. His confidence was in God, and he was thankful to God. Look at verse 13. Let's read together. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed a work in you, who believes. When Paul preached the gospel in Thessalonica, there, there were two responses. Some Jewish people became jealous and reacted strongly by starting a riot in the city. 
On the other hand, many God-fearing Gentiles, including prominent women, welcomed the message and turned from idols to, to the living and true God. In that moment, it was hard to understand how significant these two responses were. But one leads to eternal condemnation, the other to eternal life. What is the difference between the two responses? One views the gospel as a human word, while the other views the gospel as the word of God. In Noah's time, many people heard the message of God's judgment and salvation from Noah. They regarded it as a human words and died in the flood. If you study the Genesis, you can see the, uh, Noah's and Noah's family built ark for 100 years. That means Noah's and Noah's family preached upcoming God's judgment to the people for 100 years through building the huge ark on the mountain. It was enough time for the people to know about coming judgment of God. But only Noah's family was saved because people thought it was nonsense. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Two criminals heard this prayer. One of them heard insult at him. And you, the Messiah, save yourself and us. It was because he regarded Jesus' prayer as human words. Actually, even though at the time of his dying, he was mocking Jesus. But the other criminal said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Then Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Immediately, he went from the cross to paradise because he accepted Jesus' word as God's word. It's amazing, isn't it? The first, per first person who went to the paradise with Jesus was the criminal, robbers, and killer because he accepted God's word, Jesus' word as God's word right away. He was saved. Though both heard the same message, their responses were so different and the consequences were greater than they imagined. Here we learn how important it is to view the gospel as God's word. The gospel is not man-made story, but God's truth. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. This gospel continues to work in those who believe. Amen. When we receive the gospel as God's word, we receive eternal life along with the persecution. The Thessalonian believers suffered persecution by their own people, just as God's people in Judea had suffered persecution by the Jews. But those who persecuted were heaping up their sin to the limit and would at last receive God's wrath. Sometimes we hope that there will not be any persecution, right? Nobody wants to receive persecution. Nobody wants to have a hard life. But if we are Christians, persecution will happen in our lives. However, there is God's purpose in allowing persecution. It helps us, it helps us to take deep root in the gospel, refining our faith and producing growth. These days, the churches cannot have a regular church meeting or even worship service, services in many places, like China and South Korea. And our brothers and sisters throughout the world are being persecuted in many ways. This is a sign that God is at work through the gospel. Truly, we are living in the, the end of time. 
Maybe this pandemic is a sign of the persecution before Jesus' second coming. In this passage, I learned how important it is to live as a spiritual father or spiritual mother with good spiritual integrity to our children and Bible students. Usually, I ended up just as a, a Bible teacher, not as a spiritual parent. Many of, my, many of my Bible students left after a few years of Bible studies. And when I met them later, they usually thank me for Bible study. They said they really enjoyed their Bible studies. So it's like they saying, oh, I really love your Bible studies about Genesis. I really had a, you know, I really missed their Bible study time. But that's it. <laughs> really, that's it. They did not think that I was their spiritual parents. Through this passage, I learned that I must deeply repent of my superficial spiritual life and relationship with my Bible students. At the same time, I see that I did not have a good spiritual integrity to give them a good influence. Now I have only one long-term Bible student who is in China now, except my son David. So my son David is the, my lifelong time Bible student, right? <laughs> we, we, still, we still have Bible studies through the internet for many years, although we had Bible studies for only one year in US. He came to church for Bible studies for three or four times every week because he was spiritually very thirsty. So he came to UW Milwaukee as an exchange uh, uh, professor. But uh, instead of doing the research, he wanted to have a Bible study almost every day. <laughs> <laughs> it was the closest experience I had to, like I had to come alive with my Bible students because he comes almost like three and four days a week. Having a Bible study once a week with a good fellowship is not good enough to raise our Bible students as a true disciple of Jesus. Just having one Bible study a week, is very nice. If, however, if we are aim to raise disciples of Jesus, Bible study just one time or one, one time a week, it's not good enough. Basically, we have to share our lives with them, as Jesus did. I must open my life to my students and share it with them more like a spiritual parents. Just using email or chatting with them with a smartphone is not enough. It has become tough time to raise disciples of Jesus because of the pandemic. Now we cannot meet people face to face to invite them to Bible studies. Nowadays, as a dentist, whenever I give oral health instruction to my uh, patient, I say to them, we need all of God's blessing during this pandemic time. So I have to tell you, God bless you. <laughs> I'm trying to find uh, some way to reach them, the gospel. But I cannot preach the gospel to my patient when they come to receive treatment. So all I can say is, uh, really, God bless you. And I'm trying to find a way how I can say to God bless, God bless you, so I'm using the pandemic. <laughs> my office manager is not happy because he's afraid that I might offend some people. So my office major came and told me, Dr. Beck, don't do that. Some people might be really offended by you <laughs> because not everyone believes in God. <laughs> However, that is all I can do for people to help them to remember God's grace. I thank God that so far many people have thanked me for that. I'm really happy for that because none of them say, don't say like that. <laughs> so far. 
I pray that God may bless us and bless our church to overcome this pandemic period. We need God's wisdom and patience to find a way to reach out to people because we know that there are many people who are afraid during the pandemic and seek God's salvation. Clearly, people are really afraid. Maybe it's very difficult to reach them out, but it might be the best time to tell the gospel to the people. Let us accept the gospel as God's word and keep preaching the gospel with a pure heart and integrity of life so that God may work mightily in and through us. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for giving us your wonderful word of God. How important it is to accept God's word as God's word, not the man-made story. Lord, but also help us to learn from Jesus and Apostle Paul who shared their lives with their Bible students so that they may grow as disciples of Jesus. During this pandemic time, it's very difficult even to gather together in the church as a special brothers and sisters. Lord, but help us to overcome this pandemic time and that we may have a spiritual fellowship and we may have your blessing together. Please bless our college students in the Maya Bible studies this week. They come together and share gospel and this way they may grow as a spiritual leaders and disciples of Jesus in this generation. Please be the Pastor Paul and the all spiritual leaders who are going to help our college students. Thank you so much for this time. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.